We will uh, call the Chino City Council and successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency to order. Date is February 13th. Please note that all council members are present. Um, Councilman um, Flores is going to lead us in the flag salute. If you please stand and join us. Thank you. Please place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Christopher. The first item on the agenda is public communication. Uh, this is the time and the place for the general public to address the council about issues that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on an item that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to our discussion items. Item number one, San Bernardino Council of Governments, SB COG. Uh, they're going to provide a report um, on their services and the members, member dues. I don't see them here, though. I'm right here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm looking in the Hello, audience. Mayor. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am Monique Ariano from the San Bernardino Council of Governments. Um, thank you so much for inviting me out to provide some information on our process and what we are presenting um, moving forward. So with that, I'll just go ahead and get started. Okay, got it. <laughs> Um, so who is San Bernardino Council of Governments? Um, essentially, we are a collective voice for San Bernardino County. Uh, we are comprised of the 24 cities and towns and the five super, the county supervisorial districts, and we're governed by a joint powers authority. Um, we have strong regional, state, and national partnerships, and our funding consists of membership dues and supplemental program funds. So why is SB COG important? Um, we really are an agency that tries to fill gaps for local agent for the member agencies, which is all the cities and the county. Um, there are projects that a lot that come forward and they don't neatly fit into a box of any particular department. And so a lot of times things like that when they happen, multiple cities are dealing with the same thing at once. And so our goal is to really provide that collaborative um, outlet. And if there's a way that we can economize on um, scales of costs, we like to move forward in that direction. So we work on things like climate action plans. We work on housing. We help cities update their general plans. We do housing element updates. We uh, work on active transportation projects. And we have regional plans for that as well. And we like to work with our public safety sector. Uh, we've done a couple of programs with them that we um, are very proud of. Uh, there are other projects and programs and that we do that are not going to be a part of this presentation. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them as I move forward. So the first one is our emergency communication nurse system. And this one really is, um, I think, the poster child for what collaborative work can do on a regional level. Um, essentially what the program is, is implementing nurse, uh, re registered nurses to assess 911 calls to determine the level of emergency, essentially. If there, if a call, if a caller calls into the 911 system and it is determined that they are in an emergency and something needs to be dispatched, then they go through the regular protocol. But if it is determined that the call is a non-emergency call, they get forwarded to registered nurses that really provide a concierge level of service to get them to the right level of care. So if they need something like, uh, a doctor's appointment, or if they need something like a refill on a pharmaceutical, the nurse helps get them where they need to go. I mean, they even help find them transportation to urgent care if that's what is necessary. So this is a really great program that was implemented through CONFIRE, which is the dispatch agency for 85% of this, uh, the county. So they cover uh, the geographic area of most of the West County, the uh, high desert, and a, a little bit into the east, um, and they are really excited about the results. They've been collecting data since they've implemented it. It was implemented in December of 2020, right at the height of the COVID um, issue. Um, and they've seen a decrease in dispatched ambulances, and they've seen more ambulances that are available for emergencies. And they've been able to provide that lower acuity level of assistance 
Um, and so far there have been no negative patient outcomes. So this has been a really great program that's been implemented and Confire is really looking to grow it to the other areas outside of their particular jurisdiction. And so the t statistics as far as the callers, High Desert is really the main user of this, um, but there are calls that come from the other areas. And this represents 20% uh, capacity. They've been really staffing up, and as of January, they are now at full capacity. So the data as it's collected over the next year should really kind of be interesting to see if these, these levels change or not. Another program is our IREN program. Um, the Inland Regional Energy Network is a partnership program between our Council of Governments, the Coachella Valley Associated Governments, and Western Riverside Council of Governments. And what it is, is a program that empowers local governments to practice energy efficiency, to support workforce education and training in the region, and enable code compliance in the building industry. This is funded through rate payers. Uh, they pay a, a surcharge on their, um, on their bills, on their monthly bills, if they are SCE or SoCal Gas. So the funding for this program is already implemented and it comes out of the, um, the Public Utilities Commission. So what this program does is allow for public sector programs, so local governments as well as schools, any, any public sector um, organization can tap into funds for this and implement things like energy efficiency within their public buildings. Um, they provide workforce education and training for uh, the workforce to really develop into this clean energy world. And they uh, do a program that provides codes and standards for local agencies to really kind of tap into. It's a suite that um, cities can use and utilize to implement within their uh, development codes themselves. We are also working on a Smart County Master Plan. Um, and what this master plan is, is a roadmap essentially for improving technology and communications across jurisdictional boundaries. Um, a lot of cities have taken this type of effort on, on their own. And the goal of this is to really provide that connection across the jurisdictional boundaries so there's no silos. Um, this is a program, this plan has been funded 100% by the county. They provided a million dollars for us to move this forward as a council of governments, and they are looking to address growing technology needs and provide equitable resource distribution. There are some cities um, that may not have as many resources as others, and so they're looking to really kind of help uh, bring those cities up to a, a particular standard. Um, and they're looking to serve all the counties and all the juris, I'm sorry, the county and all the jurisdictions within the county. In July, we completed an early action plan that included things like planning for broadband access in disadvantaged communities. We were looking at smart intersection improvements and smart corridor improvements. We're also looking at implementing um, CAD to CAD system, which is uh, along the lines of dispatch. So uh, the idea would be to get all of the jurisdictions on the same um, system so that when dispatch goes out, they don't get lost because the maps don't <laughs> don't link up on their GPS, essentially. Um, and then ATIS and EMS is really converging emergency medical services communications with uh, real-time traveler information so that in the event of emergency situations, everybody is on the same page and knows what's going on. Um, we're also looking at in, um, completing plans for implementing zero emission vehicle infrastructure. It's coming, um, looking at hydrogen recharging, um, all of it. Um, and then again, we're looking in, in every jurisdiction within, within the county to implement these. And this early action plan is really just that low hanging fruit. So we are currently um, in the process of developing the full master plan. Um, so we are working with the board of directors and our city managers to, to get direction as we move that forward. That should be complete by December. Uh, another item that we work on at the, at the Council of Governments are grant opportunities. We do uh, grant research on behalf of our member agencies. Um, we write grants on behalf of our member agencies and we help administer grants on behalf of our member agencies. Since 2018, we've been um, successful in receiving $46 million for the region. Um, and examples of different projects, uh, we do sustainability planning, we do a lot of active transportation, um, but we're also going into the world of equity. We were successful in being awarded an outdoor equity program grant that we're actually administering through nonprofits. So there's a lot of opportunity here. It's just at this point a question of capacity. 
Um, to give you a little bit of information about what REAP is, that is SCAG funding. Um, there were two cycles of that. The first one was 2020. And that actually provided us the ability to help our member agencies update their housing elements, do site inventories to address the, uh, the needs of the state, we'll call them, um, through the RENA process. And so REAP 1 was really kind of focused in on that. And we were able to help quite a few jurisdictions get that, that up and running. And then REAP 2 in 2023, we were awarded in all of these different programs. However, this is one of those fund sources that is on the governor's chopping block, so we don't really know what this is gonna look like moving forward. We just know that we were awarded. <laughs> um, and then this is the status for the statistics of each of the, the programs. So the general grant funds, we have brought in about $32 million, and then under REAP, we've, we've brought in those. And this is the breakdown by subregion. So I presented all of this information uh, to our board of directors back in July as an update on the status of the 2018 work plan, which is essentially what, where all of these projects came from. So in 2018, the board directed me to implement the work plan with using the funding source of our PACE HERO program. Um, I'm not sure if you remember, but PACE HERO was a program uh, by which the uh, residents of the county could actually upgrade their uh, energy efficiency on their homes through loans. Our agency administered that program and we had a fund balance in 2018 and that's what we used to actually pay for all of these programs. Uh, it was 1.5 million over the five years and it is now expended. Um, and so moving forward, our only fund source is really membership dues. And based on this information that we provided to the board, they do want to increase capacity. So it is, it's not sustainable at this point and I'll, I'll get into all of that right now. So in July, I took the information forward and I gave them a look ahead of what the budget is. Um, we're good until 26, 27 when all of our supplemental funds are, are gone. And at that point we are in deficit. So if we do nothing, this is the scenario. And essentially what this means is that um, we cannot sustain even at the level that we're currently at, which is one staff member <laughs> and a grant writer. So this is, uh, this is not looking good for us if we don't do anything. And so, um, I just went through why the changes are important and I mean we can kind of I don't think I need to emphasize anything on there but essentially what the board took from that is that okay if we do nothing then we are limping along even worse than we are currently and they are very interested in expanding the capacity not just existing of, of what the cog is so the board directed uh, the creation of an ad hoc to give staff direction on how we can I, I, recommendations and opportunities that they can look at moving forward. And so our ad hoc consisted of, of the folks on this slide, and we also created an ad hoc of our city manager's tack that provided some direction and guidance on for staff as we move forward with this process. So what we looked at was our sister agency uh, budgets and their programs that they offered. So we looked at uh, WR COG CVAG and San Gabriel Valley COG, and I mean, their budgets are much bigger than this, but what we did was we kind of broke everything out where if they had additional fund sources that we don't have access to, like San Gabriel Valley has money coming in from the county for homelessness programs. They have money coming in from Metro. Uh, WRCOG has their TUMF program. So all those things that we don't have, we eliminated all that to really kind of look at an apples to apples comparison of administrative costs for their councils of government. And this is what we got to. Essentially, the average is $3 million across the board. Our spending for our Council of Governments is 658000 which is very low. And so um, based on this and the programs that we analyzed, the board identified about $1.5 million that they want to be at for spending on an annual basis for SBCOG. Um, and that is still half of what the average spent, uh, spending is here. And that is directly related to the fact that SB COG and SBCTA share staff. So COG doesn't have to fund an executive director. It doesn't have to fund a CFO on its own. We share those costs with the transportation authority. And that really helps us um, take that 1.5 million and actually implement projects and programs. So the proposed changes to the funding structure, the current condition that's established through the current joint powers authority is 50% population and 50% assessed valuation. And that's common across all the councils of government. Um, we also had two flat rate increases in 2016 and 2022. 
Um, and then the supplemental funds from here that are now expended. But the current dues that Chino pays are $20,000 a year, and the proposed dues increase to $58,000 for that $1.5 million budget for the region. Um, what we are proposing to provide are baseline services and optional subscriptions. So baseline services would be services that apply to all of the jurisdictions. And then there's an option for subscription service. And an, an example of that would be like the housing trust, right? So the jurisdictions that don't necessarily see a benefit in that don't have to participate. The ones that do, can. Um, but in order to, to move forward with the, the increase and to change how the membership dues are assessed, we need to modify the Joint Powers Authority because it is very specific as to the method of assessment. Um, we want to update that assessment to 50% population and 50% general fund based sales tax and property tax revenues. And the reason for the change is um, <laughs> the city managers were very clear that assessed valuation is an outdated method and it has no bearing on the reality of the situation within any particular city. So it was essentially a non-starter. They were very interested in increasing the capacity, but they were not interested in moving forward as it was. So we took that information to our ad hoc of the board, and so uh, they requested that we provide them <coughs> options um, for how we can do this. And we looked at, we tried to provide the most equitable means. So we looked at three different options. One was 100% population, 100% revenues for the uh, sales and property tax revenues for the cities, and then we looked at the combination. And the combination is the one that the board ad hoc is, is, was interested in moving forward. <laughs> And that was what was presented to the board in January, and it was approved. So in addition to that, an annual cost increase, um, according to the Consumer Price Index, or 2%, uh, whichever is less, in addition to the, the regular increase. And I just kind of went through all of that. Um, essentially, we looked at our, agent, our sister agencies. We looked at the existing uh, due structure, and then we identified the other three. And what that means is because we are moving forward in a different manner than the JPA uh, states, we are required to amend our Joint Powers Authority, which is why I'm here. So <laughs> um, in order, the board approved the uh, amendment number four, but all of our member agencies also have to approve the amendment in order for it to be valid. So the current grants and programs that Chino is engaged in through the Council of Governments, obviously SCAG, um, the Housing Trust, uh, the uh, Emergency Communication Nurse System, IREN, Smart County, all of these things that we're already doing, Chino has a stake in um, moving forward as well. And so the cost share across the region, uh, again, we tried to do it in the most equitable fashion as we could. So based on population and um, tax revenues, if you look at the pie chart, half of it to the right, there's essentially five agencies that are covering half of the cost, and the remaining half is split between the remaining 20. Um, and let me see if I can get my little pointer here. Chino is, oh, it's not gonna work. It's the little maroon one. Thank you. <laughs> That's where Chino is. <laughs> And so the cost analysis um, that we looked at, again, we go back to the idea that SBCOG really fills gaps for its member agencies. So if we, if we did not exist or Chino chose not to participate as a member, um, essentially what you would be doing is instead either hiring full-time staff or um, hiring a consultant to do uh, the different things that we are, we're providing, which include grant writing, which include all of the project management for these types of programs. And so with the 1.5 million, what we are proposing is to break up the, um, the cost allocation by existing staff, new staff, and then adding on resources, including consulting teams. Um, that would allow us to increase staff from essentially 1.3, which is, is really me, and then um, we would go to three, and we would do additional project management. We have a lot of agencies that we liaise with, and we are really interested in building up regional advocacy on behalf of the county and um, really building up our grant uh, section. Uh, this has been something that it has been at the forefront, as I'm sure that this county does not receive the amount of money that it ought to. And so this is one of those um, items that can potentially help address that. And then again, the resources would provide more consultant support. So as a, a 
as a part of the process that we had with the ad hoc, what we did, again, was we looked at the different programs and projects that other councils of government offer, and we provided a list to our ad hoc to say, these are things that we could potentially offer. We do not have a work plan set at this time because that would come after we actually have all of the funds approved and set so that we can plan ahead. Um, but that would be probably the first thing coming in July um, if all of the agencies approve this amendment um, to establish that work plan. And the work plan isn't staff driven, that is board driven. Um, I'm just the doer. So what we do that process is we establish an ad hoc that is uh, representative of the entire region. And then we establish an ad hoc of the city managers as well. And they provide us direction on how we move forward. If it's gonna be three year, five year, um, the priorities can change um, as your priorities change. So um, based on the list, that second column there under functions, those are the different types of projects and programs that we identified. And then that COG staff time, that's how we planned on divvying out staff. And then county staff time, in the ad hoc, the two supervisors that were a part of that discussion are very interested in potentially sharing staff, their county staff. So if there's projects that we need to get into their departments with, that would be super beneficial for us. And we are excited about moving forward with that potential. And then um, obviously we would need consultant help to, um, to implement these projects and programs. And again, this is just a jumping off point. If there are things on here that, um, or, or things that you're thinking of that are not necessarily on here, we can certainly have those discussions as we move forward with the ad hoc um, to establish that work plan. So timeline, um, the January 3rd board meeting, uh, they approved our proposals. And from January until April 30th is when we are hoping that the member agencies will be able to approve that amendment as well. And then July 1st is when the new dues structure would begin. So I just gave you a lot of information. <laughs> Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to address anything. Questions, do we have any questions? Chris, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not right now, Mary. Mark? How many total cities are you looking to get into this COG? There are currently 24 cities, and we're hoping that all of them continue. Okay, and they're all just from this area down here on the, what they call the, or is it all the It's the county? entire county of San Bernardino, every city in the county, and the, and the county itself. Okay, is there any, any talk about, because I know that we're the furthest west away from the, the county, and sometimes we don't get a lot of the resources or, or funding. Uh, and I mean, really, that's, that's kind of why we were, I would consider a COG is that, you know, being part of it, we'd be able, because I know a lot of money's going up to the high desert, and they're building up a lot of those type of areas up there with their infrastructure and all that. But we really kind of get left out over here because we're almost, even though we, I guess for the, for the small area that we are, we're, we definitely are higher with as far as the property taxes and everything else and, and all our, I guess, manufacturing and everything else. But for some reason, we're almost considered like LA County because we're at the end and, and we really don't get much, you know, resources from, from San Bernardino County. So do you see if we join this, is this something that, that may change as a result of this? So I want, to, I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying because the county itself as a government entity is, is a member agency to the COG as well. So if there are needs and questions, we are definitely a forum to bring all of these groups together. As far as the resources that the county can provide to the, the city itself, those are discussions that happen outside of our jurisdiction, but we're happy to collaborate and help bring those conversations forward if that's what you're asking. Like for example, like our transportation. So okay. We, so if we look at like Omnitrans, we continue to get more and more of our routes cut because okay. they just said we don't have the ridership. One of our our bus stops that we had here in Chino Hills or right on the border between, I guess it's it's in Chino, but it's right on, right on the border of Chino, Chino Hills. Some of the bus routes stopped running there and that caused a lot of problems for some of the residents that were here because they felt that they didn't have the rideship. But you know, in order for us to do our high density housing, you know, they all say it has to be around transit and, and all these different things that, that the state wants to be able to implement these type of programs. But 
but yet we're not getting those those type of routes here. They're not coming into this area. So, I mean, is this something that that the cog can help us to try to to get? We can certainly be that conduit. Um, our, you know, SBCTA and SBCOG CTA is that group that actually um, works with Omnitrans to establish routes and that kind of thing. So, it's we can definitely have those conversations. Yes. Um, because we do have those connections. Um, I will say that transportation is, is separate from the Council of Governments, just because it's, it's its own entity, but we share staff, so it's not like it's completely foreign to us. It's completely foreign to me, because I don't do transportation, <laughs> but everybody I work with does, so we can certainly, we can certainly help you, yes. That's all I have. Back to my original statement, I originally had the opportunity to listen to the county supervisor speak at a meeting, uh, conceptually working on a lot of these ideas that you just shared. Uh, I do understand why they want to restructure the fees. It's when you start looking at like the property value assessment, depending on what cities are where, like uh, Council Member Lu Lucio just spoke about, some of our property values on the West End are going to be different than some of the higher desert areas, so trying to bring some, I think, equity or some some common sense into how we pay into that and I do want um, your team to know as well as the supervisor to know that we have to work on these these issues that are being spoken about here today in particular also forming a, a local housing trust which uh, Senator Rubio and some of our other staff members have been talking about in order for us to be successful moving forward with implementing some of the state's unfunded mandates but I just think I want to hear, I, I appreciate your presentation tonight. I just think I want some affirmation from the city manager or staff that they are recommending that we stay connected to uh, this group and, and continue to fund it that way. So I, I think the presentation was helpful tonight. I just want to make sure you know, I'd, I'd like to hear the recommendation from our staff as well. So Dr. Reich, I'll turn it over to you and your staff on that as soon as the council is done with their comments. Curtis. I, I appreciate the the comments that have already been made, that, which echo my thoughts. Uh, I also, and this is probably more for our staff, I'm looking at the the projects, the priorities, and programs. Uh, do we have staff in place now uh, that handles grant writing and program managers and the regional advocacy and engagement issues? Uh, do we have somebody in place? The 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 cost analysis for us, uh, looking at their sheet, was average full-time cost, staff cost, um, 84000 and then the consultant cost would be 100000 Do we have somebody in place already that's doing, uh, doing this job or multiple positions that are doing this to where we don't need to necessarily get involved with this, COG? We do have a grant writer currently. I don't know the, the number in my head, what we pay for that. Historically, we haven't taken advantage of the programs offered through the COG. We haven't. So if, if we can utilize this for grant writing, if we can use it for the housing trust, because for us, being able to get affordable housing has been very difficult. Mm -hmm. And while we have some housing money to have the larger group together functioning as a, a really good functioning cog to help us do this work. But I will say, you know, I've only been in this job for a year and a half, but I haven't seen us take advantage of using them as we could use them with a bigger picture. So the question, will we, will we use them? I think we that, should. I mean, to answer, you know, you know Mayor, Pro Mayor Pro Tem, go to ahead. answer her question, I think that we have been isolated on the west end of the county for a long time, and we've not taken advantage of what can be offered for us, whether it's the housing or the AI run. We haven't even begun to even talk about that in our region. So I think collectively coming together as a county, all the cities, and working towards a common goal would be beneficial. And I don't think as a city we've really branched out and tried to be a part of that. And I know, Mary, you sit on this, so you have a, a a better look at it but even with the transportation if you just think about the transportation alone we've not benefited from that money in our region but I also think we haven't engaged holistically 
with the COG. And I do think it would be beneficial for us to be able to do that. But, but we have to consciously take advantage of that. Um, if they can help us write grants, then we wouldn't have to pay for our grant writer. Well, um, it's, it's one of those sticky kind of situations because when the half cent sales tax was passed many years ago, Highway 71, the upgrade, was the very first project undertaken. But it wasn't finished, but it was started, okay? And ever since then, we've kind of been, I'm going to say blacklisted, which is kind of a strong term, but um, the majority of the funding for SBCTA has been East Valley, Ranch Cucamonga, and High, High Desert. Desert. Okay, we've essentially been ignored, and it isn't, Linda, because we haven't asked. We've asked for help on 71 and been told no. We've asked for help on Pine Avenue and been told no. We've asked for help on Euclid and been told no. So it isn't because we haven't asked, but all of the emphasis for years now has been on the east side, um, the zero emission train, okay, that has sucked up millions and millions of dollars. Ontario now is doing the bus lane in the center of Holt Avenue, all of the condemnation of properties that are being acquired and stuff, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So we've kind of been tucked in the back. And I'm not really sure why, because I think a lot of funding that comes to the county comes from the West End. But we're treated kind of like a stepchild. So I know there are some other cities that are considering not joining this. Um, that was brought up at that one meeting. Questions were asked, well, do we have to join? What happens if we don't join? Are we guaranteed to get help if we join? And those that are not answered. So I'm going to be curious to see if all the cities do end up joining, especially the ones that aren't really getting help. There may be possibilities of getting help, like with grant writers and stuff, but then again, will we actually get the help that we need? Or once again, will we be put on the back burner because they've already allocated money to other entities like Redlands, like the zero emission train, you know, like the rail now going up through the high desert from Ranch Cucamonga, like the, the bus route from Pomona, to Ontario Mills Mall, the airport, and up to Ranch Cucamonga to meet with the, the high-speed rail, rail going to Las Vegas. All of these things do not really benefit us at all. Mm -hmm. The bus transportation situation, Omnitrans has not fully um, recovered from COVID and the cutback. Um, they've been struggling to try to increase riderhood, but they also have staffing issues. They cannot get the bus drivers that they need. So they haven't increased the routes. So we have the special um, uh, call-in bus, I can't remember what it's called right offhand, oh, yeah. but for like the students and stuff to get to school. But as far as putting back the bus routes in the West End, they're not doing it. And they're not going to do it because they don't have the funding. And of course, as you know, much of Omnitrans funding obviously comes from SBCTA. So there's a lot of good sounding programs my hesitancy is, um, and my doubting Thomas, so to speak, is will we really have access to it? So if I might respond, um, I think, I think the, the, the way for me to answer that is to really illustrate that SPCTA and SBCOG are two totally different entities and we are structured completely differently. SBCTA really exists to administer Measure I. And yes, there have been work plans and delivery plans in place since 2004 when that measure was passed. Um, it really does hang that money into those particular areas of allocation probably since it was passed. SBCOG is completely different. These funds are discretionary. They come from the member agencies the board would be the implementer and the determiner of what the work plan is gonna include on either an annual basis, a biannual basis. All of that is yet to be determined and it will be determined by the board. It's discretionary. So um, we're, not, we're not committed to a particular way of moving forward outside of board direction. You know, I understand it's gonna be up to the board how the pro program funds are spent, however, 
that recommendation comes from staff. And, and when the, the head guru of the staff attitude has been no, we're not going to do anything on the West End. Staff obviously is not going to make the recommendation. The recommendation is not going to go to the board. And the three or four cities in the West End are not the majority of 24 cities. So we're going to get outvoted unless we have support from staff to finish off some of these critical programs. And I, I understand that, but the process by which we would be establishing the work plan itself is going to originate from the board. So the board would set up their ad hoc and they're the ones that are gonna provide direction to staff. I, whatever recommendations I would take to the board through the work plan would come directly from that ad hoc, the board members. Which we don't really have representation on. Which- well, Claire's on it, but the rest is East, East Valley right. Desert. We would, so again- We would definitely need to establish a new ad hoc that is representative of the entire region. Because it is mostly West End cities on the ad hoc currently. No, it isn't. Not when you really look at it. I mean, it's Ranch Cucamonga, right? Let me get that chart map. Off. I can go back. Ontario, Rancho, Fontana, Montclair, yep. San Bernardino. But it's not the extreme West End. No, but like I said, we would establish a new ad hoc to to create that work plan. So if you wanted to be a part of that, I mean, your your recommendations would be a part of whatever it is that I would be creating. Okay. Fair enough. Mayor, I agree with your comments, but I think one other thing we have to take into consideration is I like the idea of asking, since we're restructuring this, for the ad hoc committee to be restructured so each city could see some sort of benefit or a commitment to a benefit in their community. Absolutely. But I'll say this, I mean, we should, any, any money that we give to something like this, if it improves our county, we're stronger together. And at one point, our residents are gonna drive through Ontario or these other communities, or they're commuting through these other locations already. And their frustration is already there. My frustration is I don't always like to go to Rancho Cucamonga to do anything because of how long it takes me to get there. So I do think one perspective of this has to be that, hey, if it does take the pooling of our money to advance improvements in our county somehow, hey, yes, selfishly, like, um, you know, obviously the SBCTA is separate from some of the things <coughs> we're working on here for emerging technologies. But essentially, our residents will use these things in our surrounding communities. They're presently already using them and, and vice versa. To the mayor's point and the other members of the council's point and, and council member Lucio as well, I would, I do tire of, you know, taking and not receive, receiving a reciprocal benefit of that. So I would like to see a commitment to, hey, if we're all in this together, then let's make sure somehow each, you know, you know, some of these, some of this work is touching all of our communities, not just the big five or the big six or whoever. But I am again a proponent of advancing monies together that's going to advance our county because we don't want any community that doesn't have enough funding to fall behind and not, not, not grow in advance with us. We're going to continue to be frustrated as we try to get to connecting areas. I understand. I think we're all in favor of the big picture, Karen. It's just right. um, gets a little bit hard it to does. swallow when you desperately need help and are told no over and over again, but then see the hundreds of millions of dollars spent in a completely different area and then get told no. You know, we are really impacted by Riverside County coming through our community, by LA County coming through our community, Orange County coming through our, our community. Obviously, we're not getting any help from those other counties. So we have to depend on our own county. And unfortunately, the two cities that are hit the most, um, well, three, Ontario's somewhat on the south end, but Chino and Chino Hills, you know, when it comes to 71 um, and Euclid. Uh, it's just we need some help, and, and we need an advocate who, at the staff level, at least is listening to us. And, and to date, we've just kind of been brushed off. Linda, you have, you've, you've witnessed it already, and I've witnessed it for years. Okay. It, I agree with you 100%, Mayor. Maybe there's an opportunity with the the way they're restructuring this to, like I've already stated, you know, clearly state that if you want continued support from us, then we need to see a reciprocating benefit of that. I mean, the dues, the dues are, you know, tr doubling, essentially. Triple. Uh, 12, Almost tripling. Almost tripling. tripling. But it's not going to kill us. $58,000 is not going to, you know, 
ruin our city. So it isn't like you're coming in asking for $58 million, okay? So it isn't that the amount that you're asking is so much, just we need to feel that we're being fairly treated. I understand. I don't want to shoot the messenger. No, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Well, thank you very much for coming out. Yeah. Uh, and we will be having subsequent discussions. Okay. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions or follow-up needed from me, please, I, I'm happy to come. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address this item before we move on to item number two? What are you sitting there smiling for, Larry? I love revolutionary thought. <laughs> I was just remembering a few statistical facts that the, the council might be interested in, depending on which way it's going to go with this uh, this, first of all, this reminds me of a state bond issue a few years ago for libraries. Uh, and the money was, the tax was passed, I don't remember how it was generated, and they formed a committee and the committee came up with zero library being spent in San Bernardino County, in the entire county. It kind of made me feel a little, had mixed feelings about voting for a bond issue for libraries. How could you not vote for it, but how could you not provide anything anywhere in this huge county. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at numbers a few years ago uh, as auditor controller and I noticed, I added them up, uh, the sales tax generated by the 40% of the county that was represented by the second and fourth district, that's the West End, the sales tax generated by that 40% of the population was in the neighborhood of 60% of the sales tax in San Bernardino County. Right. So there's, and, and I'm sure that hasn't changed much from then to now. I don't know when that was, five or ten years ago. Well, it must have been at least six or seven. But anyway, um, the, the fact is we had that conundrum before us when we were doing 71 as a freeway. Right. Uh, and, and I stopped and thought about it for a few days because uh, a certain uh, city council member or mayor from, from an eastern uh, Valley City was talking about how 50-50 might be uh, too much for the West End. And it occurred to me, if you think about, if you do a study of where the people are from that are driving on the freeways in the West Valley and in the East Valley, I was pretty confident that virtually no one from the 4th District was driving through the East Valley right. on their way to work because they're all going that way. Yes. And oddly enough, everybody that was from the East Valley that was going to work in Los Angeles and Orange County was coming through the West, the West, Dis the West area. So there are some imbalances that have occurred historically. And maybe this is, if the board's up for a challenge, if the, excuse me, the council is up for a challenge, maybe this is the time to have, a, have an old discussion. Uh, the other thing I will tell you, uh, strictly on the county side of things, uh, the county gets the uh, certain gas tax money relating to the unincorporated area. The unincorporated area is about 25% of the county population, something like that. But even though most of that county unincorporated population is, uh, even though a large percentage of it is, is in the uh, western part of the county, the valley part of the county, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of gas tax distribution from the state that's come to the county for all the unincorporated area has gone to the desert area, which has 90% yes. of the uh, road miles and therefore 90% of the need. Yeah. So these are all arguable injustices in how things are distributed. And, yeah. and these are the, these are the uh, jars you're thinking about opening up. Brings back flashbacks, doesn't it? <laughs> so anyway, that's my comment. Okay, thanks. Anyone else want to address the council on this item? Okay, we're going to move on to item number two, 2021-2029 housing element update and zoning ordinance amendments. This item is to discuss uh, regarding the proposed amendments to the 21-29 housing element update and the ordinance amendments yes. related to the overlay districts for affordable housing. Our report this evening will be provided by Michael Hitz, our principal planner. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. So 
Uh, if you remember last Tuesday, we had a public hearing on the housing element, uh, the latest version, and um, some amendments to the uh, zoning ordinance related to our overlay districts, which is a part of the implement implementation of the housing element. Um, so at that meeting, there were some um, concerns and some uh, thoughts about things we'd like to discuss. So uh, council had directed us to come together with a workshop today to kind of go through uh, some of those thoughts and concerns and just sort of kind of lay out some, some things for you so you can kind of understand um, all of the related issues that we uh, are facing with this housing element. So we kind of laid this out into um, kind of four discussion items. The first being uh, proposed revision of the housing element and the zoning ordinance related to state legislation. Um, there was a few questions on that. Kind of a little more information on how the site inventory maps work, the inventory matrix, and then the existing capacity buffer and related to impacts if they're proposed. Um, and then the potential impacts to having a non-compliant housing element. And the last item is sort of a discussion if, if there's a desire to amend the housing element this time kind of or, or, or later what that timing may be, or the different tasks that would have to take place with that. So I'm going to um, kind of move this over to our, our, uh, one of our city attorneys, Brian Wright Bushman. He's going to kind of go through some of the slides. I'm here to answer questions. Dave Barquist, our consultant for the housing element, is here, and then Warren's over there as well if uh, you have any questions of him. So, Brian. All right. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. So I'll go through these slides. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of information here. Some of it is complicated, and I'm happy to stop at any point and answer any questions you have, so don't feel like you need to wait till the end. <clears throat> so first, uh, on the housing element legislative revisions, I just want to go over kind of what the requirements are. Um, again, just to remind us all where we're at. So the city of Chino is required to accommodate 3,397 lower income units in its housing element. So I'm just going to stop right there um, to explain some of the terms. So accommodate, again, as, as I think you all know, but just to repeat, it doesn't mean those have to be built. It, what it means is the city has to have in place certain development standards, which by which we mean um, you know, <laughs> how the buildings can actually be built, how they fit on the property, but also zoning and general plan standards that could at least theoretically and plausibly um, allow those units to be built at certain income levels. And who decides whether it's plausible to build those units is the state. So the state establishes what development standards have to be in place in order for us to count those units or those sites as uh, capable of accommodating lower income units. And when we talk about lower income units, what we mean is units that could be um, affordable to either low income households or very low income households, um, which are terms that are defined in state law and it's based on a percentage of area median income for the county. Um, there's a couple different ways that we accommodate these. Some, um, we look at uh, sites that are already in existence in the city that could accommodate some of these units. Um, we also look at um, how many accessory dwelling units it's reasonable to anticipate will be built. And then any remaining units um, have to be accommodated through rezoning sites in the city. So um, the, the number here, it states that there's 3,350 that have to be done through rezoning. Um, I actually need to back out uh, 86 more units from that. So the, the number that needs to be accommodated through rezoning is actually 3,268. Um, but big picture, it's, a, it's around 3,000 have to be gotten through rezoning. Um, so Sites that are rezoned to accommodate lower income units must meet certain requirements. And again, these are established by the state. So some of those requirements follow. So first, um, they have to be zoned in such a way that the city will um, give what's called by right approval of a project on those sites. If 20% of the units in the project are affordable to lower income households. And so what that means is if a developer comes in with a project and they say, we're willing to put uh, record a covenant on the property that guarantees that at least 20% of the units will remain, will a be only available to lower income households and B um, that the landlord can only charge a rent that is actually affordable to the, to someone at that income level, then the city has to approve that project, um, assuming it meets the development standards, the city, the city has to approve that project without any discretionary approval, so we can't have like a CUP or something like that, a conditional use permit. 
Um, and as a result, they're not going to have to do any environmental review because environmental review is only required when there's a discretionary permit. So it's a, essentially if someone comes in with a project that's going to be at least 20% affordable, they're going to get kind of a fast-tracked uh, treatment from the city, and that's required by state law. The second is that the development standards on the site... Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Would, would they be required to meet the number, the zoning number, like if it's 20 per acre? Or is this by right, would they, could they come in and say, oh, we want to build 50 per acre? They would be required to, yeah, good question. They'd be required to meet all the development standards, so they, they, which includes density. So, for example, if the density was uh, 20 per acre, they'd have to come in at 20 per acre. With 20% low income. Correct. To get the buy right. That's exactly right. Okay. But they would have to stay with our general plan. They would have to meet our general plan. Well, so, okay, so there is, um, there's one caveat. But um, generally speaking, yes, they would have to meet general plan and um, zoning requirements. There is something which we'll talk about later, but I'm happy to talk about now, which is called the, uh, the builder's remedy. That is a situation that, it, that only exists during a time period when the city does not have a compliant housing element, which is now. So if the city had a compliant housing element, then yes, someone would have to meet all of the development standards. If, if the city does not have a compliant housing element, which is what exists now, and somebody comes in with a 20% affordable project, then they can build it wherever and however they want, regardless of the zoning and development standards and general plan designations that are on that property. Really? Yes. They have to go through environmental review, um, but you know that doesn't that, that's not to say that the city can just deny it, but they, they do have to go through environmental review still. But yes, they don't have to comply with general plan or zoning standards in that case. Um, this doesn't, those kinds of projects um, are in fact happening. Um, I, if I had to guess, I, I think that there may be eight or 12 cities in, in Southern California that are dealing with those kinds of projects right now where people have come in and proposed things that would otherwise never be allowed and the cities either have to approve it or if some cities are fighting it, but they are, these things are happening. So they could pick like the old golf center at Iola Park and say we're gonna build housing there and there's nothing we could do about it? Is it, is, is, it, is that private property or public? It's public property, it's park. Oh yeah, they, they couldn't come, I mean if somebody, they would have to own the property Oh, okay. so, so since it's public property, they couldn't. But if it was private property, then the private property owner um, could come in and say, we're going to build housing here um, at a higher density, higher height um, than would otherwise be allowed in the city. But that's only if we don't have our housing element correct. approved, correct? That's correct. Once your housing element is approved, um, then all of your zoning and general plan standards must be complied with. Okay, which is okay. So they can't come in at that point. I just want to understand that. Mm -hmm. The by right, they can't come in after we've got it approved and disrupt our, our general plan, our zoning requirements the way they exist today, correct? Well, he's talking about the builder's remedy, yeah. not the by right. Well, right? yeah, I understand that. I, I'm just trying to understand that once we, uh, we get that approved, our housing element, they cannot come in and build, you know, a higher density development than what our zoning requirements show currently. Generally speaking, that's correct. And, and the reason I'm saying generally speaking is, is there are some other limited exceptions in state law where uh, developers can override cities, um, but those aren't related to whether or not the city has a compliant housing element. So generally speaking, yes, once the housing element is certified, they have to comply with their zoning and general plan requirements. And just by way of example, I believe the density bonus is one of those opportunities. If oh. the developer seeks to do yep. more than that 20% affordable uh, component, you actually have a schedule in your code and in, in state law that says if they provide additional affordable units, then they get a either additional density, lower setbacks, et cetera. Less parking. 
or there's another um, provision that went into place in uh, July 1st of 2023 that allows developers to build housing in commercial zones under if they meet certain requirements. Um, but those requirements are, are usually very cost prohibitive. So those projects have been very few and far between, but it is possible, for example. And there's really nothing at all the city can do about that, no matter what it does, because state law is just trumping cities on that. Um, but Again, the big, the big picture is, um, yeah, if you don't have a, a compliant housing element, um, it's kind of open season for developers to come in if, as long as they have a 20% of, of, of their units are affordable. And then after it's in place, um, then yes, the city's general plan and zoning codes generally apply. Um, the next requirement is that the development standards must permit at least 16 units per site. It's not stated exactly in state law how this works, but how we're understanding this is if somebody comes in and um, they say, you know, we, we want to build at least 16 units on this site, but if, we've, if we try to meet your development standards, like for example, the amount of, the percentage of the property that we can build on or the height or the setbacks, if they just say, look, it's like, physically impossible for us to build 16 units on the site because your setbacks are so big or something like that, then um, our understanding is we would need to relax those standards to the extent necessary to allow them to build at least 16 units on the site. Okay, what if it's, um, what if it's zone RD 4.5 and they want to build 16 units? So um, this would only apply to properties that are uh, set aside in the housing element as ones that fit for low income residential. And so all of the properties in the housing element that, um, that are set as, that, that we are saying, um, basically are, are, are suitable for low income residential. That we've designated. Yes. They all have an overlay over them, right. which allows, um, density up to, uh, 30 dwelling units per acre. So it would only ever happen in a, on a site where that high of density is allowed. It would never happen on just like a normal RD 4.5 site. Okay. Yep. All right. that's, good. that's good news. Some good news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the big picture here is, the, uh, j again, just I'm, I'll kind of drill down and then step back up, you know. The big picture is the state is saying, look, if you're really saying that these can be developed um, for affordable housing, generally that's thought to be to be dense, uh, lots of units in a, in a development, you you need to actually make it those kinds of projects feasible on these sites. I mean, that's that's what the state is trying to do. Like, you can't just say these are able to be developed for low income, but then set these really tight requirements so it could never happen. Um, if you're going to say these are available for low income and could accommodate low income, then you have to have development standards that actually make that a, a realistic possibility. I think that's the at least the intent from the state. Um, another requirement is that there must be, uh, first of all, uh, at least 30 dwelling units per acre of density must be allowed on the site. And there also must be a minimum. 20. It does. So I'm going to clarify that. So, uh, so there must be a minimum density of at least 20 units per acre. So that's a minimum density. Um, but a density of up to at least 30 units must be allowed on the site. So what that means is um, projects are supposed to have at least a density of 20, but they also have to be allowed to go up to at least 30. So the range would be somewhere between 20 and 30 generally on that's the site. That's if they get the 20 percent set up. 20% low income? No? No. So there's no way you can make a builder do 20%, right? Uh, the only way, do we have a inclusionary? Uh, we do, but it goes up. It's, it's a range of 9% uh, at 26 dwelling units an acre to 13% at 30 dwelling units the acre. So we have nothing in the code that requires 20%. We do require, if you're going to use um, the affordable housing overlay, is it also it's also required for the, M, for the MUL, right? Yes. If you're going to use either the affordable housing overlay or the mixed use overlay, you're supposed to have, depending on what density you want, you're supposed to have a range of between 9% and 13% affordability of affordable units. And, and what do we have right now? Uh, the, the requirement is somewhere between 9% and 13% affordable if you want to use the overlays the city has created. 
And it's interesting that we wouldn't require it. Why, did, why did we not require the 20%? Uh, my understanding is that those were based on a feasibility study that was done by a consultant to see what can actually be built. The idea is if you require um, a higher percentage of affordable units, there's no way a project can be financially feasible at that level without a high level of subsidy. Mm -hmm. And so um, at that point, HCD, when they're reviewing our housing element or our other or our zoning, um, one of the things we're supposed to do in a housing element is identify government constraints to the building of housing and remove those constraints. And so if you require um, a high level of affordable units, on one hand, it sounds good because you're saying we want more affordable housing in the city. But what it also sounds like, I, I'm not a developer, but what it, I think what it also sounds like a, to a developer is, well, that's just not going to pencil because we, as you recall, if a unit is affordable, it, it puts a cap on the amount of rent that the owner can actually charge for that unit. And so it really cuts into the, to the margin. So it, it makes the units, uh, or it makes the projects, um, in some cases, essentially impossible to develop without a large amount of subsidy from some source. So this buy right will probably never happen. It, it will probably be rare unless a project comes in with some amount of subsidy. Okay. And that's so it. don't have. So they'll have to get it through, uh, yeah, some kind of state or federal funding, generally speaking. So, so I'm looking at these numbers, and so it's that we're asked to accommodate 3,397 lower income units. Uh -huh. So right now, if we let's say we looked at a, the project that was just passed on Chain Hills Parkway, which is 300 units, mm -hmm. but only 15 of those are low income. So are we only going to take off 15 from that number? That's exactly right. They built a, a 300 uh, unit building? Yes, that's exactly right. So, so theoretically, we can identify all these locations and then they're only putting in 20%, which could be, or 13 to 9%. Yes. We'll never reach our number. Yes. <laughs> I mean, th there is a, there is sort of an, an oh, it's not a secret. I mean, it, when you look at the numbers, there's kind of an open, um, what's, it, there, there's something imaginary about all of this, which is to say, well, sure, we can accommodate these, but we know that no one's going to actually build, like very rarely, Will anyone be able to build even 20% affordable on a property, let alone 100% affordable, right? So even though we say, theoretically, someone someone could come in, we say, look, let's imagine that there's a site out there that could accommodate 300 units, and it meets all the requirements for a the development requirements for a low-income site. What we can say in our housing element is, look, this site could theoretically support 300 low-income units, and the state lets us do that. But everyone knows that 99% of the time, no one can come in and build a 100% affordable project. At most, you're going to get something like 9 to 13%. Or in that case of the, uh, the Chino uh, Creek Apartments, it was 5%. Um, so yes, and then um, we're going to go more into that, but then it, it cuts into the amount of units that you can, that you can actually uh, accommodate. You actually raise a very good point, Council Member Lucio, because as we we will explain, those numbers, the fact that that project came in under the affordability threshold that it was designated for will actually keep harming the city's ability to meet these numbers and take away from that buffer that we... That's why created. we had the buffer. So it's a very good point you raised. That's, yeah, and that's exactly right. Like, like, like you said, Mayor, that's why you have the buffer, because you know that these aren't real numbers so so you you plan to accommodate way more than you're actually required to because you know that um, as a matter of fact a lot less affordable units are going to be built on these properties than the maximum that could theoretically be built um, so the fourth bullet here and this gets to the mixed use issue you can accommodate all of these units by uh, essentially just upzoning residential properties where only residential uses are allowed. Um, upzoning means increasing the density. So you could just take all of your uh, RD 4.5 uh, properties in the city and bump them all up to RD 30, right? Um, but another way to do it is to instead use mixed use sites, um, which is what the city has done in creating the mixed use overlay. 
But if you want to do mixed use sites, <coughs> the state has requirements for that. And those two requirements are first, that the site must allow 100% residential use. Um, it doesn't have to be 100% res residential use, but it has to allow that. And the city must require that 50% of a mixed use project is residential, um, which means it can't, um, if, you're using, if you're using the mixed use overlay, there, there has to be a, a residential component of at least 50%. So getting back to um, kind of the impetus for this, the, the, um, the amendments to the zoning code that were brought before you last week are all designed to address um, these development sta standards and, and make sure that the um, that the city's code is meeting the requirements that are in state law, um, and specifically that they're doing so in a way that um, HCD finds acceptable. So that that's the reason for these changes, and that's what these changes are trying to accomplish. Right. When did these uh, when did these changes come in? You know. Um come into play? I mean, three years ago when we started working on this, were these um, rules, um, rules then, or did they just come in recently? Yes, they were rules then. Rules then, okay. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. Are there any questions about the, any, any of those issues? Questions or comments so far? I know we're going to keep going through this presentation, but I guess one of the biggest issues that was um, brought up the other night um, was that you know we just um, want to be conscious about some you know some of our our our, re our shopping centers right up and down Central Avenue. Um, you know how do we how how can we how can we preserve those right? And I mean that's what we got into tonight's workshop. Mm -hmm. So I guess one question maybe I can ask now, or maybe you can keep in mind and answer later. But sure. you know I guess. I mean, I, I would want to know, I mean, from what would be your recommendation to meet our goal, um, but also meet, you know, this housing element goal, um, you know, and the goal of, again, preserving our commercial centers as much as possible, um, but also getting this plan approved. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and that's exactly what the next five or so slides is intended to explain, so I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, and if and uh, I'll, it may take me a few slides to answer your question, but if if I haven't, please please remind me again. But I think I will. So um, yeah, I mean the simplest way, if you want to preserve, I know there was a concern that you'd really like to have um, commercial uses on these commercial sites, right? Um, but now, if we have the overlay on them, then we have to allow them to potentially be developed with a one hundred percent residential. So um, the simple answer to how do we preserve the commercial sites is to take them out of the mixed use overlay. So you would rezone them and you would remove the mixed use overlay from them and then they would go back to being um, just commercial sites. And that way the only thing that's allowed on those sites would be commercial. So that's how you would do it. But what I want to tell you tonight is that there's very serious and potentially detrimental implications of doing that. Um, so could you do it? Yes. but before you do it, you should understand what the implications or the consequences of that would be. So that's what I want to explain. Um, in order to explain it, I, I just I, I promise not to get too into the weeds, but I, I, do, I want to explain to you kind of how the a portion of your housing element works. Um, so there's something in your housing element called uh, the, the sites inventory. And the sites inventory is a list of all the sites that can accommodate um, housing. And it's and there's a column, uh, there's a couple columns that break it down by what income that housing can be, uh, what income level that housing can be. So, for example, this is a snippet from your um, sites inventory. I didn't go. This is a. It's pinched in from the sides. Um, but the important thing to see is we've got the address. So this is each one of these is a each one, each one of these lines is a site. And then you can um, you can see what the the zoning is. So these are all in, in uh, either the affordable overlay or a mixed use overlay. It's under the overlay zone um, column. And then um, you can see uh, the very far right column says uh, low to very low. So these are the um, these are the lower in these. This is the amount of lower income units that we think that each site can accommodate. 
um, if we if we sort of do the math in accordance with how the state wants us to do the math. So, for example, the first line, uh, 11488 Central Avenue, the city is saying that that site theoretically has the de has appropriate development standards in place to accommodate 46 uh, low or very low income units. That's that's how that reads. Um, now, the next thing to know is that if you were to go through that table, um, the whole thing, which includes, uh, I can't remember, over 100, maybe 200 sites, um, and you added up all of the columns in the very low income, or all the numbers in the very low income column, um, and then you added in a few other things, so we also get to add in um, the amount of ADUs we think it's reasonable to anticipate, and also some existing um, low income sites you would get to a total of 4,958 lower income units that can be accommodated in the city. But if you recall from a few slides ago, you're only required to have 3,397 lower income units. And this is where we get to the concept of the buffer that we have that was mentioned earlier. So the city um, originally had a buffer of 1,561 lower income units. Okay, so as originally designed, that was the buffer. And as we stated, the reason you have the buffer is because um, you know it, it's it's not likely that sites will actually develop these many uh, this many low income units on. So now, um, as as Councilman Lucio said, I uh, want to talk about that um, the Chino Creek project. So um, every time a city or excuse me, a site in the site's inventory gets developed, the city has to sort of recalculate these numbers. You could call it like a true up, however you want to explain it. Um, so for example, the Planning Commission recently approved a project on sites 132 through 135, uh, which is known as the Chino uh, Creek Apartments. And um, th this project was slated to potentially accommodate um, 219 lower income units if you add up those columns on the far right that are highlighted. But in fact, the project only provided 15 lower income units. Um, and, and it met this, you know, it, it met what it was supposed to do, but that's just how many units it provided. Um, and so the result of that is that our um, our, our, our share of the regional housing needs um, allocation, that's RHNA, RENA, goes down by 15 units. That's what the chart shows. Um, and also the units that the city can accommodate goes down by um, 219 units. And the result is that it reduces your buffer. So just from that one project, the buffer goes down 204 units. So does everyone sort of follow that? Or does it or would would anyone like me to explain any part of that again? You okay with that? You understand? Yeah. yeah. So that's so that's how a project can and that's that's not, you know, may, maybe it's maybe we wish it wasn't that way, but that's not because anyone's done anything wrong. That's just sort of how it's designed to work in a way. Um so another way to look at it is the previous slide showed we had about fifteen hundred uh, units as a buffer, you now subtract 204, we have, what is it, 1,300 and change of a buffer. Yeah. So the next uh, slide shows total and actual forecasted losses to the buffer. Now some of these are, have not actually been realized yet, but they're potential. So the, um, uh, in the left-hand column is the cause of the loss and the, and the right-hand column is the actual loss. So. Chino Creek Apartments we talked about, so that's 204 units are out. Um, the next two are projects which are pending. They've been submitted. They have not been approved, and I don't know what the timeline is on those. They may not be approved for months or even years. I'm not sure. Um, but if they were approved, um, you can see the loss to the buffer um, for those projects as well, 272 and, 90, and 79. And then the last one is, is called Martinez v. City of Clovis, which is a case that came out in April 2023. That was after the city had already uh, put together its housing element. And what it essentially says is that if you have, if you use an overlay, um, as, as you'll recall, the minimum, uh, the minimum density on these properties is supposed to be 20 dwelling units an acre. 
However, some of the city's sites that have the overlay on them, uh, the overlay, if you want to use the overlay, uh, you have to build at at least 20 units an acre. But the underlying zoning might be RD 4.5. And technically, that means that someone can come in and still do RD 4.5. Um, now, this overlay strategy was one that was uh, has been widely used. My understanding is that uh, HCD didn't raise any concerns about it, may have encouraged it. I don't know. I wasn't part of those conversations. Maybe others can speak to that. But there wasn't any sense at the time when this strategy was being developed, not only by Chino, but by several other cities, that there was anything wrong with this. But then a case came out um, last April saying that actually you can't count these sites if they have a density in their base zone, uh, which is lower than 20. So HCD hasn't said anything to the city of, of Chino about this, but to be conservative, um, we want you all to know that uh, we think there could be an issue with 425 units in the buffer, which is the total of... Um, the sites that are RD 4.5, RD 8, and RD 12 sites. So those are these are the Martinez v. Clovis sites. So uh, just to give you a big picture, uh, if you take out just these projects and the and the Martinez v. Clovis sites, the remaining buffer is now down potentially. Um, if these projects were to get approved, would be down to 581. And of course, that's not as of now. That's if these projects get approved, which could happen months or years from now. But just the point of this is just to show you how quickly um, the buffer can be depleted. Um, and what, uh, given what we know now, uh, your, your current buffer um, realistically is, at least if you're taking a conservative approach. So this gets to the point about um, the, some of the commercial sites. Um, so as I said, it, in light of the in light of the current state status, you can see. I mean, not all not all projects are going to have such drastic results. Th these are some big projects, like the two hundred and four unit one, or the even the two hundred and seventy two unit one. Those are very much on the high side. There's a lot of projects that would, you know, could take out three or fifteen units from your buffer, not several hundred. But you get the idea that it's at least possible that. A handful of projects could can significantly reduce the buffer. Um, and then for context, so I've we called this the town center, but what's it actually called, Mike? Yeah. Chino Town Square. Chino Town Square. So um, sites 139, 103, and 140. For example, if the city wanted to take those out of the mixed use overlay, those sites are currently, um, you know, hold, holding the place of. 433 low-income units. Um, so if we took those, if, if, if the council wanted to remove those and say those are just going to be commercial sites, no mixed-use overlay, you could do that, but it would reduce your buffer by 433 more units, and then your buffer would, um, again, taking a conservative approach and in light of the, these pending projects which haven't been approved yet, your buffer would be down to 148 units. So getting really close. Um, and um, you may be wondering, okay, well, so why do we why do we care about the buffer? So this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. So if um, next, slide. next slide, yeah. So what happens when the buffer runs out? So when the buffer runs out, um, that means that the city is no longer capable of accommodating its share of the regional housing needs. And when that happens. Um, the state uh, state law requires the city to rezone additional sites to accommodate um, the re its full amount of the regional housing needs. So if um, if the buffer runs out because of a project getting approved, like for example the Chino Creek Apartments project, then the city has 180 days to designate new sites. However, if if the buffer runs out because the city just decides of its own volition to rezone sites, like if, if, if um, you know, let's imagine that our buffer's at 500 and this council decides to um, take more than 500 units out of the mixed use overlay, then that would just be due strictly to council action. And in that case, 
at the very same time that you removed those sites from the mixed use overlay, you would have to designate new sites basically in the same action. Um, so it's not, the point is, it's not a matter of simply taking these out of the mixed use overlay. Um, it's to say you could do that, but the more we do that and the closer we get to depleting the buffer, the more likely it is that you're going to have to pick <coughs> additional sites in the city that have to be rezoned um, to accommodate these lower income sites. And that again means when we talk about rezoning, that means establishing sites, either residential sites or mixed use sites um, that allow uh, or that require a minimum density of 20 dwelling units per acre and allow at, um, up to at least 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, so just high density sites essentially. So um, I'm gonna, oh, I guess I'll just, yeah, to finish this. So you asked for a recommendation, uh, Councilman Flores. Recommendation would be, um, as I see it, what's before you is, is two issues. One is you want to have a compliant housing element. We've talked about some of the implications of not having one. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But one hand is you want to have a compliant housing element. Right now, in order to have a compliant housing element, HCD is, has already said that the substance, well, you essentially need to adopt the, the changes to, um, to the housing element and the changes to the zoning ordinance that HCD has essentially signed off on. And they've said, if you adopt these things, we'll certify your, your housing element. So that that's the way to do it. Um, your second concern is, is with these commercial sites. Um, so staff's recommendation would be to move forward with and adopt and approve the changes to the housing element and the zoning code. What that gets you is a compliant housing element as soon as possible. I mean, it could, I don't know how long it will take. I think it could be, I think it's reasonable to say it could be like within 30 days of adopting those, those ordinances and housing elements, you would send it to HCD. They've already looked at it all. They've already blessed it. It shouldn't take them that long. I mean, famous last words, but it really shouldn't take them as long, that long. They've already looked at it all and already told us that they're fine with it. So 30 to 60 days maybe. Um, and then to address your second concern, if you, if the council decides that it wants to remove some of these sites from the mixed use overlay in order to make sure that you're preserving the commercial uses on that site, you can do that. But we would recommend that you also at the same time consider what other sites you might want to rezone in their place. Um, because otherwise you're going to get in a situation where you're either forced to do that anyway or where you can't accommodate your sites. And, if, and, if you, and what happens is if you get into a situation where your housing element cannot accommodate the lower income sites and you don't do anything about it, like you don't rezone additional sites, then the state can come back in and say, you're not complying with housing element law. You, they would probably send you some kind of a letter and say, you need to rezone more sites. And if the city didn't do it, then they can then decertify your housing element, which of course the city doesn't want. So again, just to summarize that, the recommendation of staff would be move forward, adopting the changes to the housing element and the, and the zoning amendments, get your compliant housing element that stops the builder's remedy. It stops other repercussions that we'll talk about in a minute. And then after you've got that compliant housing element in place, then you can go back in and change out some of the sites if you want, and that's fine. But that's gonna take a little bit more analysis of what some of those replacement sites could be. And I guess to say it a different way, figuring out what those replacement sites are gonna be, let's, uh, let's imagine that you want to change out the MUO, the mixed use overlay sites. No matter what you do, whether or not you um, adopt these, the proposed changes that came to you on Tuesday, no matter what you do, picking new sites, rezoning them, um, going through that whole process is going to take several months. And it will take several <coughs> months regardless of whether or not you have a, a uh, compliant housing element. So you might as well have a compliant housing element. 
right, um, to stop the repercussions. And then after you have that in place, um, move forward with potentially cons considering switching out some of those sites. So, uh, I, yeah. And just a quick question, Mike, probably you can answer this. Have, you, have we already identified alternate sites that we could rezone in order to accommodate that if we wanted to, to make that adjustment? Have we already done that? Do we have a listing? We, if you remember way, way back when, we did have some other sites that we looked at that we kind of totally pulled out and added others back in over time. Um, so we don't really have a, a strong list to say, hey, here's our hip pocket sites we could go and look at and choose. We probably anecdotally know of a handful that we could look at, but you really start getting into potentially looking at residential sites or sites that are in areas that are maybe adjacent to residential may not be as desirable. So those are why we originally took those out in the first place. Um, there may be some opportunities in the preserve, there may be some opportunities elsewhere, but as of now, we have not, you know, we don't really have like a, lo a long list of sites we could easily add back in. Well, since, since we're talking about alternative sites, if we were to, let's say, identify the site that we're currently trying to get from the state, which is the, the Stark property, how many, how big of a, or how many units could we say that theoretically that would be able to to take up so that we could take off another site. I mean, what are we looking at? I don't because remember. Because that, that one we're kind of looking at for low income anyway. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact acreage there. Um, I believe part of it was in the runway protection zone, so you wouldn't be able to do any housing any anyways. Um, and then you're still at that same situation where you, you, from an inclusionary standpoint, you can only ask for a certain amount of affordable units because of the, uh, of the limits we talked about earlier of of making it economically feasible. That's what our, the Kaiser Marston study kind of identified of what's economically feasible in that range of 26 to 30 to the acre at those percentages. Another, another important point too is we can't sort of isolate sites in certain areas of the city. We have to have a, a mixture spread out through the city. That's very, HCD made that point very clear to us as we went through this process. So we have to be sure that we're not removing sites and putting them more kind of centralized in one area of the city. So, so when we look at a site, let's say like the one in College Park, which is, um, I forgot what we call it, is that the bridge? Yeah, bridge housing. How many of those, of the, all the units that they made there, how many of those were low-income housing? All of them. Yeah, those are, there's 330 affordable units there, but that was a, a part of, that was in a previous um, housing element. And we subsidized. And we, sub, yeah, that was partially subsidized. $10 million. Yes, and I believe the developer may have donated the land, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and that was a part of the development agreement that they had to do 15% of the 2200 in College Park to be able to build College Park. So when we're looking at the Stark property, if we take that over from the state, they're not selling it to us, they're giving it to us in order for us to do low-income housing. So, I mean, that, that's, some, that's some sort of project that we're going to be looking at to try to I just... I think they're going to give us the land. Are they looking at giving us the land or are they selling us the land? I don't think they're going to give us the land. We have to buy it. You know, there there are things that we haven't talked about also, and that is, you know, we're in the process of annexing some of our sphere of influence. Um, one question. If the county has already designated areas within that sphere as um, arena numbers, do we have to stay with what the county has done if we annex it? I think how it works... There is, I, I know there's a code provision that specifically talks about this. I haven't looked at it in a while. My understanding of how it works is um, that there's a, there's a basically a swap of, um, of arena numbers. So the, the, I don't know if it's answering your question, but the county has a, has a allocation of low income sites that they need and the city has one. So if you take over their land, then you take over a proportional number of their units as your requirement. Does it is it determined by what they've already zoned it as, or is it like a, a land percentage of like if they have a thousand acres in the county and we take over um, ten percent of their land, then do we have to assume ten percent of their arena numbers? I I would need to check, but my recollection is that the county and the city are able to enter into an agreement about how they will swap their arena numbers. Or how many, how many, uh, what percentage, or how many units of the county's allocation the city will take over? It would make sense to me to, to be based on 
how many units those properties can actually accommodate. I mean, that would be the most reasonable thing. Like how many, well, how many units did you plan for this site? And then the county would, or the city would just take that many units into their arena total. Um, but. It, well, I don't know. Or it, 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 might, it might not, that would be, I, I'll take that back. That would be one way of doing it. But I, I think that there's room, if I recall correctly, that the county and city can negotiate about how they want to do that swap. Okay, I think that's something I'd like to have you look into, Mike, and, and find out definitely because our sphere of influence that we're working on acquiring, okay, that could potentially help with the buffer. Um, YTS, as, as Mark brought up, you know, if we get that, that could potentially help. There's also a section of land north of YTS that I understand has been designated density, and I don't know, again, did that count in our numbers, or is it a state designate? You know, those are the kind yeah. of things that are kind of gray out there. The, the one just, the, the one site that you're talking about that, that was the state had long ago had offered up as a potential, as a surplus site, the 10 acres that's just south of College Park, just north of the, north, is yeah. a site in our housing element now. So as, it is as an already, site. we're already mm -hmm. counting that. Yes. Okay, all right. But I mean, I, there's some gray areas out there that we don't know what's going to happen with yet that may help us on this buffer issue. But, you know, going back to looking at that one chart that you put together with, um, that can you flip back a couple of the no, site's inventory? No, one more. Yep. That one. When you look at, at those acreages, like the the um, 0.47 at a density of 25, so you're talking you could only build about you know 12 units, and you're saying that we counted 11 of the 12 as low income. It, it, what it did was it counted 100 percent basically, or close to the site being developed as, as, low income. as low income, because as Brian alluded to, is this is the only way really the city, the, the state would allow us to do, because you don't know. Someone could come in with 100%. Could. So we're right. allowed to count it towards our arena, even though we know, you know it won't happen. that it may not ever happen. So that's why Although, then we, uh, then Otherwise, we'd be in a situation where we'd have to find hundreds of sites oh, rest of our city you know to to be able to get to that number so the state works in in some way with us to be able to do that and it's kind of important to note in that instance when we're picking a site it's it has to be a parcel and so those are all parcels that are sort of kind of in close proximity so the concept is there is you would then assemble those pieces together and create a project out of those four or five parcels that you, you want to but practically identify. speaking we'll never get those kinds of numbers of low income. to the three thousand yeah Another op option, um, we talked about the Martinez v. City of Clovis issue, in, which takes out, I can't remember what it is, like 584, something like that. As you recall, the problem with those sites is that their zoning allows development lower than 20 uh, dwelling units per acre. Um, I'm not saying that, I'm, I'm not making a recommendation on these, but just another thing to do that could be done is would be to rezone those sites just to make them all RD20 sites, even as they're like, as their base zoning, not just the not just the overlay zone, but just increase the density on all those sites to twenty dwelling units per acre as a as a minimum, um, and um, then you wouldn't have to pick new sites. You could use those sites that have already been picked. You would just change the base zone or the base density on those sites, and that would be a way of getting back uh, whatever it was five hundred. I thought it was. Oh, oh, was it just four four twenty five? Yeah, four hundred and twenty five. Um, units um, like, again that so that that's another strategy without even having to pick new sites but Brian you know I understand what you're saying on that but we're also dealing with quantity of quality of life oh and yeah some understand of those all, units yeah. are in regular neighborhoods right and so say you have a regular house on a 4.5 and all of a sudden your neighbor builds 20 per acre I mean that's going to be intrusive that's going to ruin neighborhoods I, I completely hear you and I, I understand. I guess what I would say to that is the fact currently is that they could do that now. No, I understood they yeah. could, but... But they don't have to, you're right. They don't have to. That's right. So I'm not saying, again, this is not a recommendation that you should do that. Just to say, if you didn't want to have to identify new sites, that could be another way of, of getting some units back. That's all I'm saying. And, and the other thing to say about all of this is that um, part of the... Part of the timing issue is that um, depending which sites you pick, you um, may have to do another measure M vote. Yeah. So it, it's not, this isn't like the kind of thing you could just fix in a month. Unless it's within 
the preserve or, you know, if the timing was better, you'd have the new annex, annexed area that would not be subject to Measure M. Yeah. So either, either of those, any newly annexed area, including the preserve, would not be subject to Measure right. M. And some of the, the annex, annex, newly annexed areas that we're looking at could possibly, especially like if it's, if it's on a major thoroughfare like, like Ramona or something, could handle a higher density and not be a negative impact on people. Yeah, like a good example of that is on the northwest corner of Pine and um, Riverside. Those properties are already have a general plan designation of mixed use that we did with our last yeah. Housing element update. There's no pine and river. There's no pine. I'm sorry, pipeline. Sorry, I, pipeline and riverside. Pipeline and riverside. Uh, again, yeah. uh, I think we knew it. Yes, pipeline. Uh, so that is a site that, that is already has a mixed use designation, but, but it is in the county. It's right. in the county sphere. Right. So we don't, we don't have the ability There's to no do housing anything. There's no tracks around it. So if we got that annexed in and it developed. So, the, so again, in any as a part of the general plan, we're looking at modifying our mixed use zoning code. Re regulations to be more consistent with what we've already done. So. Now, another question. Because um, I know I was really interested in, in true mixed use, you know, kind of um, different, but, but kind of like they've done in the preserve around the new State of Brothers, right? You know, they're doing all the real high density, which is going to support that whole business center. So my, what I thought when we went through this was when we called something mixed use, like up at the target center that we would get that we would get a similar kind of product but we would have like commercial on the bottom and apartments on the top how do we get that kind of true zoning that they can't play with do we come up with a brand new zone i'm not talking about rita i'm just no. talking about how do we how do we do that which could potentially have yeah we we units. have a mixed use um section or zoning code. We just don't happen to have any mixed use zones in the city proper, just what's in the sphere. So we could, you know, um, more likely or not look at this at the sphere the, the sphere area because it's already there. And some of that already is allowed, but we did kind of it's a little more open where we require, you know, you could do a horizontal, meaning you know, side by side residential or and and then commercial next to it. Or we could just say, no, we only want vertical with mixed use on the first, we can draft those uh, code code of <coughs> easily if that's what the direction of council is. Because to me, that's is. what our mixed use was: was that we were going to have a true combination of commercial and residential. And we and when we did the mixed use overlay, the, it was really designed with the intent of that to have a first floor retail right. office component. But we didn't want to limit the ability to do a horizontal as well right. as an option as well. So. Well, it seems like the critical thing right now is to get this housing element adopted so somebody doesn't figure out how to play the game and come in with the builder's remedy and really mess us up with something that we don't want at all. And that might go. And then start looking at it to see if we want to modify something, but at least get it locked in so the games can't be played. So a couple of points, if I may just point them out. Um, and Brian was going to speak a about the builder's remedy. And one of the reasons I asked him to come is because he's been deep into these issues and has actually been litigating a builder, builder's remedy uh, case. So he has a pretty good working knowledge of this. But in response to your question, Mayor, about what happens to the arena numbers when we annex, um, the statute actually reads the way Brian explained it. Um, the county and the city would reach an agreement to transfer a portion of the county's allocation to the city and then the Council of Government. So coincidentally, our COG would have to accept that. If there is a disagreement between the city and the county, then it's, it goes to the COG uh, <coughs> to look at whatever methodology each jurisdiction has used to justify their numbers and the COG actually makes that decision. So mm -hmm. that's the way the statute reads. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Mayor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Or maybe more of a comment. I think that all my math instructors throughout my education would tell me that none of these numbers pencil, basically. I mean, we've already talked about we're walking through all this, and when you get to the end, nothing adds up. It doesn't add up the right way. It's like, you know, 
math is communicative, you know, there's a way you, you check your math, and there's no way to check any of this math the right way. So my problem with this is the way I see it is right now that <laughs> even if we do this and we get it adopted, all of our buffer and everything can be done because of the way the projects are going to come along. They're going to mandate us every uh, three or four months to try and go back and find new numbers and new locations. In the end, that's what's not being really clearly articulated here, I think, is, hey, we can do all this, and if these projects go, unless we pick up some additional low-income housing someplace in the future through annexation or through maybe state property, um, I think in the end, we're still going to be short every which way but loose. We might be. We might be. I mean, that, I think that's really what we're, what we're saying here is in the end, and I don't know what the solution to that is, um, but just saying like, oh yeah, the, the buffer or this or that, no. I mean, when you really look at how this all plays out mathematically, it, it doesn't work out. So, just well, stating that. The state at least accepted the numbers. They did accept the numbers, but we also know that those numbers will be eaten up within just a few projects. And then we'll be back in another arena cycle. I don't, it, it depends. Well, it happens every 10 years, whether we like it or not. We'll be back in the arena cycle, but I think what we're, you know, if I'm not mistaken, what they're saying is in just a few projects within that arena cycle, if they developed, we could be back in it anyway, or back into trying to get something adopted because in those years, those could be gone in just two or three major projects. So it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible. I guess um, on one hand, I think it's wise to be aware of that. On the other hand, I will say, you know, two of those projects were are pending. I, I don't know, do we have any timeline on those projects? Well, one's more pending than the other. Uh, the other one's more of a preliminary review, kind of, you know, says and have submitted an official application. The other has an application in that we're working through and we anticipate being before the com uh, Planning Commission in the next few months. No. And it's also important to note is, um, that those are the larger sites. There's a lot of much smaller sites that will probably either never get developed because of the multiple different owners or just where they're located. So there are some larger ones that are sort of low-hanging fruit. They're vacant. They're easy to develop because of the vacancy and, and the size of the, the sites. So um, those are a few of those out there, yes. You know, but but, but to, my, to my point, Mike, it, yeah. we, don't, we don't want that either. Right. We don't really want sites where, like, oh, yeah, they'll never develop because then the end of our arena cycle will come and we haven't met our numbers again. And not that those, these numbers are even right. attainable, but there's this balance of really wanting development that helps us get as close to that number as mm -hmm. possible, right, without having to give up buffer numbers or this or that. Because if we're doing this, we want to put forth a good forth effort, you know, faith effort to try and make those numbers but you know, in one one breath, we're like, well, these will probably never get developed because they're so difficult, and that's why the state's doing what they're doing is saying, hey, you're you're going to do this, you're going to do these buy right things, and then, but on the flip side of the coin, because of some of the regulations, the the numbers don't pencil out for us to even keep our buffer, in just you know potentially you know four or five projects. Is it legal? Is it potential that there could be sites that develop with low income units that we haven't even identified? And they would count toward arena numbers, even though we don't have them identified, correct? That's correct. Any low-income sites, any low-income units you get count, even if they're not ones where you have <coughs> Are all ADUs considered low-income? No, but it's a good percentage of them. And we work that out with HCD. that They're allowing us to count a certain percentage. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head what that percentage is, but the, the assumption is that they could be counted towards. So they are allowing that as a part of our... Are they also allowing when people convert their garages and rent them out? That's yeah. part of the ADU. That is. Yeah, part that's of like a junior ADU potentially is. Yes. Okay. I I'm just curious to find out what other cities are doing up and down the state. Uh, we can't obviously we're not the only city dealing with this. Well, uh, Dave, what, Dave has a lot more experience in, in, what, in, so in, what's, in that. What's the answer? What are they doing in order to answer these questions that we have currently? It's the, the it's the same story throughout the state. It's uh, very similar, just like with the overlay situation. It's not the exception. It's a rule in many cases, especially in Southern California, where we're in a recycle of land, and so we're seeing a lot of that. And so th that's something that we're seeing across the state. I was just at a meeting last night in Northern California on a housing element, same exact issue. Um, in terms of the 
the the buffer and all those opportunities. Uh, the conventional wisdom in the beginning was, why should we give so much, you know, keep it low? Uh, as we've gone through this, those buffers have pretty much expanded uh, significantly, in some cases, you know, 30% above. And the reason was for that was the same issues that came up with these no net loss issues. And I could say from the numerous jurisdictions that we worked with, I think the uh, common conversation is really about um, let's make sure that we have enough buffer so the challenges of doing the rezones in an ad hoc basis over time is very difficult, and especially when there's changing economic times, you have a little less control. Uh, and that, that's what we found throughout the state, at least in, in the, you know, the sick cycle, because it's changed everything with all the new regulations. And you, I've seen your reaction to some of the new requirements. Those are all new for this cycle. So again, it's just this big uh, burden of responsibility around cities. And you know, there's not a perfect solution. The sites are really speculation over time. It's your best guess of what's going to happen. Uh, we can't predict it perfectly, and that's the issue is we give ourselves a little fudge factor uh, to allow that if it, if, you know, it doesn't go exactly as we plan, we have some flexibility. So I don't know if that answered your question. I'd be happy to answer any other Well, I, you know, it, having this thought in mind, you know, the challenges that everybody's experiencing, not just us, but everybody up and down the, the state, the state has to know that everybody is having these issues and challenges are you aware of the state doing anything to try to meet us someplace in the middle? I, I know that's probably a joke, but uh, you know what is the state doing to try to help us out? Bringing in more people. I mean, I could tell. I could answer part of the question because I represent the Orange County Cog. We've worked with through SCAG, uh, that is the direct communication to the state HCD on the arena numbers. And when they were developing these numbers, we kicked and screamed that these were unrealistic numbers. And SCAG was sort of on our side, arguing that the numbers weren't really matching what the statute required um, when HCD came up with the numbers. They, we firmly believe HCD did not follow the statute. So those efforts, to, the diplomatic efforts failed and OCOG ended up filing a lawsuit as well as several um, Orange County and LA County cities joining in. Unfortunately, the court just did not believe that um, the jurisdictions had the authority to challenge HCD's application of statutes. So the diplomatic efforts failed, the legal efforts failed, but at the end of the day, these numbers are very unrealistic and, and Chino's not the only one, believe me. So having said that, Kurt, I'm almost to the point where I would rather just see us go out and Never do knew how much choke. a comprehensive count on, we already have residents that have casitas and half acre lots that have yeah, affordable housing in the back that people have built. And I think maybe that's a component that we missed here. We go out and start scouring the city with people who are already living in their garages, already living in the, in the backs of their houses. I mean, you know, the housing tract that my, my aunt and uncle live in is probably 40 or 50 half acre lots and almost every single one has one or two lots in the back or we better start making sure that we're getting a, a count on that. Yeah. What's happened is people have gone and, and built all those already. Yeah. And I would almost say, hey, to every resident in Chino, if you have one of those lots, let's start getting our minds around uh, putting you know, your, your family member's ADU there or your, your, your garage, because that's a more sustainable solution to this. If everybody did that right now in Chino, we'd probably make these numbers. And there's a good chance that there's a lot of those units already out there that we're not getting credit for. So I don't know if we can count them since they're not new. Can we count them if they're not new? Need to us. <laughs> if they're already in existence? It's a question. But the other thing is, Mayor, there's, there's plenty of people out there who probably wanted to do that in the past. No, you know, I'm just yeah. wondering yeah. if we can mm -hmm. count them if we didn't know that they were there and we now count them. To me, that's objectively more of an attainable number for us because of the way our, our, our community is zoned and how it's laid out right now. It probably depends on when it got permitted. Um, I, you know, we... 
they have they come up occasionally where we find out that someone built something illegally and then we make it legal you know through that process um, and you know this is something that gets reported so we're tracking <coughs> and we report every annual we have to report to the state um, you'll get that you see that report every year we report those numbers um, to the state so those will be pulled out of our arena number as we develop go through this and we know we and you know, if you if we recall we also have the um, pre-approved plans that we allow people to to utilize to go out and build ADUs. Um, so we're really trying to help push push that issue. In fact, the state uh, adopted a law requiring cities to do that. We were already ahead of the game on that. But I'm thinking what Karen is saying is, is kind of fly over the city and see if there are units that are there that we don't know about that we can and yeah, and I, words, I don't know that they've been them. developed, built illegally. <laughs> they just probably didn't get the proper permits, Mike, because they didn't want to go through that process because right. they're on a parcel of land where for many, many years we allowed people to build that way, and, and I don't have a problem with it. I mean, there's tons of people in our community that have done that, and, um, you know, it, it, it's... I don't know if it's a large number, but there probably are some over the last, you know, 10, 15 years that have been built as those laws have loosened. You know, especially probably in the last uh, six or seven years, where you know development impact fees have been reduced and other things that make it more economically feasible for people to do that. There so may be we, a lot out there, Mike, that never got yeah. permits, but out yeah, they, garages you know, and different things, the incomes, conversions. Hit people, COVID had and hit, and then the people came home, families yeah. reunited. But that is so something. I, you know, go ahead. I think the mayor pro tem raises a good point. So the, you know, to the extent there were some illegal created uh, accessory dwelling units. The law now not only encourages, but in some cases requires the cities, the cities to approve them right. if, they, if they meet certain criteria. And like Mike said, they're very relaxed criteria. So it may be that there are a lot that we, were not within our radar, right, when we looked at the site's inventory. And as we do an analysis, I mean, the hope is that people recognize that they can easily permit those now um, and come forward so we have some analysis and inventory that we could take advantage of. Um, but I assume the when we did the housing element and sites inventory, we assumed a certain amount of ADUs, but it would, we may not have necessarily tracked all the unpermitted ADUs. Right. We, when we did this analysis, we sort of went back and we kind of looked at previous years that we had that were permitted and kind of came up with an estimate of what we presume in the next cycle, how many units would be built based upon on, what, on the data that we had at the time of what units that were built previous years. And I, I think the idea, I don't 100% know the answer to this, but I think the idea is that when you count units, the idea is that you, f you fix a point of time, and that's the beginning of the what's now we're in the sixth cycle, and you establish what the need is for housing at that time. And when you consider, you know, whether or not it's accurate, when you cons when you make the determination of how much housing is needed, that determination takes into account all the units that already exist, whether or not they've been permitted. So I think in order, I would think in order for you to count a number or a new unit toward your excuse me, toward meeting your arena, it would have to actually be built in the cycle. So I, I, I just don't, I don't know the answer to whether you can count existing units that have now become permitted toward your arena because technically they already existed before the cycle started. I don't know the answer, but that would be my thought process. But you could, I mean, usually if they're not permitted, they usually have to be modified because they don't meet legal requirements. So you could stretch it a bit and say they have to rebuild it, they have to fix it, therefore it's a new unit. Yeah. It's a new legal unit. I, th I think that's something that we could look into. I'm not, I'm not sure how HCD handles that. My understanding is that the, uh, that's the right answer. If we do uh, require some modifications and it now becomes a no, live a legal unit, legal <coughs> unit then it, it's sort of a newly <laughs> acknowledged and created unit. It's not part of that baseline. Well, I think it's a good idea, Karen. You got a good idea to you know, really <laughs> yeah, community and, and find out what's out there. But that and, doesn't change the fact that we need to get this thing adopted, so we don't get. I'm scared to death of the builder's remedy. In all honesty. And and just real quick, just the the, the numbers is that we estimated 160 ADUs to be built in the eight-year cycle. 92 of those were allowed to count towards our arena number, as as the way it's we kind of set up working through HCD. It's a heck of a lot better than our high density. 
housing ratios. Yeah, yeah, it is a heck of a lot better. I think just to keep going, we have a couple more slides. I think it's important to get into the, some of the impacts of the non-compliant, and then we have a one last slide related to uh, timeline. So we've we've covered some of this. Uh, the builder's remedy we've talked about a fair amount. Um, just as a quick <laughs> reminder, builder's remedy projects can be on any site. Um, they require that the project comes in with 20% uh, of their units being affordable to lower income households or 100% uh, being affordable to moderate income households, I believe. Um, the builder's remedy applies um, regardless of Measure M, so um, you, you, it doesn't require a Measure M vote to approve a builder's remedy project. Um, the one other way to, the only situation in which you don't have to approve a builder's remedy project is if it if you could show that the project would have a specific adverse impact that can't be mitigated in any way. Those findings are very hard to make by design. So, you know, for example, if someone wants to build a, a project somewhere and there's literally just no water to serve the project or something, well, like, you don't have to build that. But um, those kinds of severe impacts that can't be mitigated in any way are, are very few and far between. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then the, the builder's remedy is available as long as the city doesn't have a housing element. But once you get a housing element in place um, that's compliant, I should say, that the HCD finds is compliant and the state finds is compliant, then the builder's remedy goes away. Um, and then the, the second or the last point, I'll, I'll, we'll go back to the first bullet, but the third bullet, um, there is a possibility for someone to also sue the city, to compel the city to um, amend the amend their housing element and or um, amend their zoning code to bring it into compliance with housing element law. Um, in my experience, um, which is which is limited on this issue, but in my experience, um, I'm aware of one city that got sued on this, but it was, it seemed to be part of a coordinated strategy to force the city to approve a project. So the, uh, there was a developer that had filed a builder's remedy application and the city was fighting back against that. And so um, simultaneously, someone filed a, you know, presumably working in concert with them, filed a lawsuit, also challenge, challenging their housing element and suing them on that. And it just, it was sort of like a pile on thing to build up, um, uh, you know, j just throw a bunch of things at the city at once, essentially. Um, so I don't know that there's a high risk of this, but it, it is a possibility. Um, and if someone files a lawsuit um, then and, and wins, the court can force the city to make certain changes to its housing element and or its um, zoning uh, code in order to become compliant. And the court can also... Um, suspend the city's authority to issue certain kinds of building permits or take other kinds of land use actions like doing rezones or other kinds of things, um, at least temporarily until the city comes into compliance with housing law. Again, I, I wouldn't say there's um, a real high risk of this happening. I'm not aware of it happening very much, but it is a real risk. It is a real possibility, so it's something to be aware of. Um, I guess who, who knows what the, what the what the likelihood is, but I'm not aware of a lot of these lawsuits being filed. That's what I'm saying. Um, and then I will turn it over to uh, to the, these guys for bullet point number one as well. Yeah. So um, just there was a couple. We do have. We we are aware of at least two uh, potential grants that we had attempted to apply for over the last couple of years um, that resulted in it, in uh, about six hundred thirty-six thousand dollars of grant funding. We were not able to get because. In order to apply for the grant, we had to have a certified housing element. Um, this was money that was looked at potentially to be allowed to work towards some of our transitional housing that we have planned to do in the future and to be used for other city housing programs. So as of now, because we don't have a certified housing element, that we do not have um, the ability to receive those funds or even apply for those funds. And I'm going to let Dave, there's sort of a little laundry list of other, of other uh, grant funding out there that we could be at risk of not being able to acquire because we don't have a certified housing element. Uh, thank you, Mike. And then the, um, I think the distinction here is that over the course of the year as the different budget cycles, these th things change. What we're seeing the trend is that anything that's coming through the purview or the responsibility of HCD 
is typically has that caveat that you have to have that certified element. Uh, but there's a list, the uh, Affordable Housing Sus uh, and Sustainable Communities Grants, uh, Sustainable Transportation Planning Grants, Infill Infrastructure Grants, Local Housing Trust Funds, the PLHA, which is Permanent Local Housing Funds, are just some examples. But there's also the uh, benefit of having the certified element where, uh, for example, in home investment funds, it's a criteria in the scoring that ups your uh, position. Uh, so there is a pro-housing designation is something that some of your neighboring jurisdictions have taken advantage that just gives you a little extra on your score when you're going after these competitive grants, uh, which is there's a lot of those uh, in the, uh, the trend that we've seen. So, and these can change over time, um, not just housing related, but things that are tertiary related like infrastructure, uh, so you have an issue with uh, uh, infrastructure improvements that you need that really help the feasibility of a project when you get those investments as well. Mike, is there any way you can tell us um, what grant funding we've accessed in the last four or five years because of having an approved housing element? We went back and looked and you know talked with our um, you know some of our staff and they did not find that there was grant funding that we didn't receive, but we didn't really necessarily apply for a lot of grants. And to keep in mind, as Dave was alluding to, a lot of these these changes have become more recently because the state's trying to really force cities to have certified housing elements. So mm -hmm. they've amended some of these criteria to make it a requirement where it may have previously been uh, com you know, substantially compliant versus fully compliant. Mm -hmm. So there's some changes in the law that have now kind of forced this to say, yes, you have to have a compliant housing and you cannot apply. Yeah, I'll just uh, turn it back over to Mike for the um, the last slide, which is, again, if you did want to make um, additional changes to the housing element, um, which would be maybe either adding additional sites or, tr or, you know, taking out some sites and adding others, we just wanted to advise you about what the potential timeline for that would be. So I'll let Mike go through that. Yeah, and, and we already mentioned, you know, Measure M could be a likelihood. So that's that's obviously adds a vote <coughs> to that mix. But we have to do, you know, tribal consultation because anytime you change a general plan or specific plan, we have to do that. We'd have to work with Dave and his team to revise the document and make sure everything in there is consistent with uh, state law. We'd have to meet probably with the property owners if we're removing sites or want to add sites. We want to meet with them to kind of let them know what we're doing, or at least have workshops and invite them to those workshops. Um, there's a 60-day review minimum by HCD each time we submit, so they could, we could submit. They could, we can make, ask us make changes. We could resubmit, so that could go several, you know, iterations until we get to a final, somewhat approved document. We have to do additional public review. We put the document out for the public to see, consult, and then noticing, of course. And then we have to go back to planning commission and city council at some point with a final document for uh, recommendation with planning commission and adoption by the council. And then final approval of HCD. It's hard to say what this timing is. Um, if you throw in Measure M into there, it could be six months, a year, it could be longer. Um, so we don't know what that is, but I just want to kind of say there's a lot of multiple steps and things that would have to happen if we made any changes to the current housing element as, as it's currently um, before you. Okay. Yeah. That basically kind of concludes our presentation. We, you know, if you want more questions or Comments, we're here to entertain those. Okay. Mark, do you have anything? Chris, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, when the buffer runs out, um, you, I don't have the slides up here anymore, but um, what did you say it was 150 day? Um, so, yeah, 180 uh, days. 180. Mm -hmm. In those 180 days, um, does the uh, does the rem the, does the builder's remedy get triggered in those 180 days? Uh, no, it wouldn't. As long as you have, so if you have a, um, if you have a compliant, like if HCD finds, sorry, HCD is the acronym for the the state agency of, of that's in charge of housing. So if HCD finds that your housing element is certified, which means it meets state standards, um, and then you go below your buffer, and so you're in those 180 days, you remain compliant. You remain certified, um, as long as you are, you know. Ac actually do identify those those sites within that 180 day period 
the only way that you would um, would come out of compliance would be if you didn't identify sites after that 180 days. I don't know exactly what would happen, but I suspect even then, um, if HCD became if the state became aware of that, they would probably send the city a letter and say, "Hey, you, you're not in compliance with this requirement. You have X amount of time to come into compliance with with this requirement. Otherwise, your housing element is going to be decertified." The short answer is no. During that 180 days, you you would remain certified. Okay, and then um, can. Um can properties that are zoned public, um, can those be used, um, I guess what I'm trying to ask, yeah, can we turn public zoning into, you know, one of these mixed use overlays or um, can we change public zoning to, to meet our, our arena numbers? Um, if the city owns it, you can change the zoning and allow for housing, yes. You could donate the land to a builder and let him build. But, well, well, can the city remain possession of the of, of the land yes. and, and still yes. change? Yeah, I mean, you could work with a lender, uh, with a builder, and and have the builder build on public property. Yes, if, if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to. I think there's options out there. I mean, <coughs> any other comments? Question, Brian. You had you had mentioned. Um, if we were not in compliance, a, a developer could go in and pretty much build residential in, in, in that area. But you had mentioned that the cost would be just tremendous. Do you remember talking about it? Can you, can you explain that a little bit more? Um, yeah, so the, um, I just want to make sure I'm answering the question you're asking. So when I was talk specifically when I was talking about the ones that were um, really expensive, that was a, a specific state law called AB 2011. Is that? Yeah. So I'll explain a little bit more about that. So there's kind of um, there's <coughs> sort of three buckets. To get into that. This it, it's just unavoidable because housing law has gotten so complicated. Sort of three buckets. So one is the builder's remedy bucket. So that's what applies if you don't have a compliant housing element. And they can just go in and build where they want, and they have to have 20% affordability. 20% affordability is, um, is higher than what the feasibility study found was feasible, but it, you know it, it's, it's not 100%. So those projects are possible, but they're still not super likely. The next one is um, the, the buy right uh, approvals that we talked about, those exist even if you have a compliant housing element um, and they still require 20% affordability. Um, yeah. And then, um, but the AB 2011 one I was talking about, those, um, what that law says is regardless of the status of your housing element, even if you have a compliant housing element. On certain sites, um, developers can go in on properties that are zoned, generally zoned commercial, and they can build housing without having to get a zone change. So it, they don't have to get it rezoned to residential, it just stays commercially zoned, but they can build a housing project. Um, and there's more nuance to it than that, though. So in order to be able to do that, they have to meet two expensive requirements. There's other requirements, but the most expensive one, are, as far as I know, are these two. The first is that they have to pay prevailing wages on the project, which increases the cost of construction and labor. Um, and the second is they have to meet uh, an affordability requirement. So. Um, I printed this out in case you asked. Um, the affordability requirement if the project is is on a commercial site but it's not adjacent to what's called a commercial corridor. There's this concept of a commercial corridor, which basically means anywhere in the city where the right-of-way is, I think, at least 70 feet wide. 
if a project is a, is a, up against one of those commercial corridors, then basically they have to be um, have fifteen percent low income. If the project is not up against one of those commercial corridors, then they have to have a hundred percent low income. So those are going to be less likely. But it's possible that someone could come up on one of, on a commercial property that's up against a commercial corridor. They could have a project with 15% um, low income, or they can do, in some cases, uh, well, yeah, there's a couple other options, but that's the main option. So essentially, they'd have to have a pretty high affordability component, and they'd have to pay prevailing wages. That's why it's unlikely, because those are both expensive requirements, and so um, those projects will probably be f few and far between, but... I don't know the actual numbers on how many of those projects have been built statewide. I've only personally um, aware of one of them in the cities that we work with. But yeah, you answered the exactly the question I wanted you. To. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, our next steps. I'm assuming this needs to come back to us for consideration of adoption. <coughs> Correct. It's been adopted by or approved, whatever, by the Planning Commission. Right. We did not approve it because we needed additional information. We've had the opportunity to hear the additional information and ask questions. Now it needs to come back to us again. And you may recall the council kept the public hearing open and continued it to a date oh. certain, which is your next meeting on the 20th. Yeah, which is on the 20th. Okay, so it'll definitely come back to us on the 20th. Okay. Um, now, you, everybody in the audience has heard the discussions and stuff. Is there anyone who has any comments they would like to make? Yes, come forward, please. And restate your name for the audience or for the record because nobody knows who you are. And I apologize. I realized a moment ago I failed to do that. Uh, Larry Walker, um, retired. Retired well, council, retired, retired mayor. supervisor. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's a lot going on here, and and I I have been working from the belief that the city of Chino is working to really accommodate affordable housing, and that and I'm also generally aware of the fact that that's not generally true. In answer to somebody's question a few minutes ago. Uh, there aren't very many cities around the state that try to defend low density or agriculture or anything like that. They're mostly just uh, whatever the developer wants to do, uh, zoning increases. And that the same thing has, has been, my experience has been true uh, about affordable housing. So we got these state people who, who are they're not over here, they're somewhere, and they, they don't believe us. They don't believe that we're genuine. And, and they're looking at this thing as to how we are going to engage in a process that's going to skirt our responsibilities to get affordable housing in place. Uh, and they're trying to stop us. As a result, they've taken a, well, they've, they've caused your staff to take a, an overlay process that specifically was put in place so we wouldn't rezone the properties residential. They are not zoned residential. They are zoned commercial or other something else. And there is an overlay that offers the potential for someone to come in and fulfill certain requirements and therefore get a development done. But these are not residential properties. If they were, then we could all be accused of scamming the people of Chino and the worst Measure M scam in the history of this city because all of a sudden properties that couldn't have become residential without a vote of the people under Measure M are, are being characterized by somebody as residential. Uh, so, so I don't... I don't even see how this is possible, but I, you know, I dealt with, I worked under the uh, Subdivision Map Act for decades in this state, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing attorneys sit at council meetings and say, well, because the city is not following the law, they need to do this. The Subdivision Map Act is the law, officially. It's not the law in terms of what people are enforcing, but somewhere that legal question is going to get answered in the next decade or so. And, and it's, you know, in the old days, when somebody used to introduce a bill that would change the law, they would put in the bill that it, it, it uh, takes away the old law. Now they just pass more laws, so you have everything here. 
And that's what you're going to have if you pass the, anything close to what's being proposed to you tonight. You've got an, you've got, the, the goal is affordable housing. What this proposal does is opens the gate for massive apartment construction with very little required affordable housing. Although I must say, I, I was looking during your uh, discussion, um, I can't find the part where it says you don't have to get 20% affordable housing in order to, in order to operate under this, uh, this uh, ordinance because my copy of the ordinance says you, that, a, that um, a housing development project in which at least 20% of the units are affordable to lower income households shall be a use by right on the following sites and then list the sites. So I do think you have a requirement for 20% here. Seemed like you, that wasn't what you were being told a while ago, but I may have gotten lost. Uh, so it seems to me, we talked about this before when we did the overlay, that you don't have to develop 100 apartment units to get 20 affordable units. You can put together a project to build 20 affordable units and you have just as much compliance under affordable housing law as if you had built those hundred. And you've got a lot less apartments in your town, which somebody out there is going to thank you for. And the idea, it, it's a hard one, because I've, I've already acknowledged those state people are out there just waiting for us to try another sneaky move. But somewhere there, there's got to be a way, to, and, and I, I noted the irony of being, you're being told that you can't, you might not be able to uh, get a grant to do affordable housing because you don't have enough affordable housing in your, in your uh, plan. That would be a, an extreme irony. And it was also noted that the grants that have actually been done over the last few years have been for other housing, not for affordable housing. So I think th there's got to be a way to talk to somebody at the state level about getting affordable housing built and giving us an opportunity to try this new way to do it. But I'm, I've been to Clovis, and I, I have an idea of what's going on up there. I, it's, it's going on all over the state, and it's the background against which we work if we're trying to do this. Um, by right doesn't make any sense when you're, in a, uh, when, when you're in an overlay because the by right right in, that, in those areas that have the overlay but are commercial zoned underneath, the by right right is commercial. And if you contractually give a bunch of people the right to come in and build residential uh, because of the way you do your, your, your affordable housing ordinance, you're giving them a legal right that they do not have under the law that, you're, that we've been operating under for the last 30 or 40 years. I've heard a lot of stories about what people can do. Oh, by the way, if you get into checking out people's ADUs, the assessor is going to want to hear from you too, and then the, then the thing is going to get really uh, involved. But uh, the, the, there's no residential zoning here. I think that's the key thing. This ordinance will allow developers to exceed Chino's affordable housing responsibility because if they come in here and build, uh, they're going to do all sorts of they, they can exceed the numbers that, that of apartments that you're concerned about in, in zoning those properties commercial, and yet they could not meet the housing, affordable housing requirement because they don't have that many units. Uh, there's this, this, uh, this proposed ordinance before you tonight makes three changes. It deletes a paragraph, adds a couple paragraphs. Deletes a paragraph, adds a couple paragraphs. But what it actually is doing is equivalent to bringing you the overlay ordinance totally stricken out with some new language about what you're going to do instead. There's nothing left of the overlay here. Uh, just a lot of stuff that confuses some of the action. And, and I would encourage the council to weigh the, weigh the challenge of dealing with the state and trying to communicate with the state what you're trying to do here. Get some staff and some council who are responsive to your policy. By the way, the other thing that we've noticed is if you, if you, if you adopt this proposed policy change and the, your present planning commission, which is not too in tune with your affordable housing policy, continues to approve everything that comes in that has no affordable housing at all or very little, 
uh, then you're going to see that buffer going down, and I think that's the process that's been going on for years around here. So we, we need to find a way out of this, and I, I don't, I'm suggesting to you that what's being proposed to you tonight uh, is not a way out of this. Uh, you, you can talk about builder's remedy, but how different is builder's remedy than the right to come in under your overlay and build whatever they want to build and make you like it? It's, it's, a, it's a, th a thicket, and I'm still waiting to hear about that uh, thing that, that you don't have to have 20% affordable housing. Maybe they'll talk about that. But uh, you got a big challenge before you, and, and I re really, <laughs> I guess I should be careful about saying it too much, but the overlay proposal was a good one. It was a tool to accomplish affordable housing. All you needed was some money. And all you and all you need to do it. I don't know. Do you have any left over from the uh, affordable house from the uh, <coughs> development agency? I know. I noticed your agenda still reads uh, su successor agency. If the successor agency has any money at all left, it's probably yeah. in that housing that was never spent, and that would be an ideal. We're place actually to trying things. to get money back from the state that well, they owe us. Later. But that's what I'm saying. So you talk to the state and you say, "Look, we're for affordable housing. Could you just let us have some of the money that came from us?" to build affordable housing and see where that goes. I mean, you it's know, of course you do know, you're very aware of the state's fiscal condition right now. Well. We've uh, been trying to get our money back for years. Well, that's, <coughs> there, I, you know, I'm aware of the original litigation that got us into the whole redevelopment thing too. And if, if, if everybody had been thinking about things differently back then, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, <laughs> I read that whole uh, decision uh, the week it came out, and uh, it's remarkable how short-sighted the attorneys and the cities were that engaged in that litigation. It was dead wrong, and the, and the cities of this state have paid dearly for the hubris and the miscalculation and the legal lack of comprehension that was displayed by the people that took that item to the Supreme Court. Well, and it hurt cities like us that did a lot of good things with our redevelopment agency. Absolutely. You know, it just killed I don't, us. I don't remember where we were, though. The, the big sin that everybody committed was you collect this 20 percent uh, set aside for housing, and very little housing was built out of that set aside statewide. Some of us and, actually used it for well, what it was know. supposed to be. And, and I, I don't recall specifically Chino, but, and, or when, or if, or that sort of thing. but. But that's where we are. Unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of people are really doing the tricky stuff that the state <coughs> suspects everybody of, and they don't make life any easier for you folks in your administration of this city. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to address the council? Okay. Um, any responses? I'd be happy to respond to the 20% question if you'd like. Yes. So, um, I'm looking at the ordinance, which has the, the red and the black on it, in case anyone wants to fall. Um, the, the, the first section, section. What page are you on, Brian? Uh, I think this is 31 of the packet. Okay. Mike, feel free to chime in if you think I missed something. Everybody there? Yeah. So, um, the first section is uses by right. So this is what this is saying is there's a state law that says if you include certain uh, properties in your site's inventory that were also used in previous cycles, that those sites have to, um, the projects on those sites have to be a use by right if they include 20% affordable housing. So this isn't saying that they have to include 20%. It's just saying that if they include 20%, then they have to be a use by right on those specific sites. Um, the language um, in D1, the very first red paragraph, a housing development project in which at least 20% of the units are affordable at the lower income households shall be a use by right on the following sites. So that's just taking the language from state law and, and kind of putting it in our code. But again, you don't have to develop it at 20%, it's just that if you do, it's on those sites, it's gonna be a use by right. Mm -hmm. The other use by right language is on um, page 47 of your packet, the very top in red. 
So this is again just uh, right out of state law. So notwithstanding any other provision of this section, uh, residential developments in the affordable housing overlay or the mixed use overlay that are, uh, I'll skip some of the language, but basically that are included in your site's inventory and meet the objective development standards of, and density requirements in this section. And then here's the language and in which at least 20% of the units are affordable to lower income households shall be a use by right. So they don't have to have 20%, but if they do, and they meet those other requirements and they have to be a use by right. But the actual requirements for development and the, um, or for inclusion of affordable units, there's a few. Um, for example, on page 43 of your packet, Um, in the middle, this is a section uppercase I called minimum affordable housing requirement. Mm -hmm. This language is already in, in there. It's not a change. Um, residential developments in the H or the MUO that have 10 or more dwelling units shall provide the following minimum number of affordable housing units. So for rental projects, you have to have at least 9% of the total units affordable to lower income. And for sale projects is 3% of the total units. Um, and then if you go back to um, page, sorry, I'm taking you on a little tour here. Uh, if you go back to page 34 of your packet, the very top, Here's this table, and it explains that if you want additional density, then you have to give the city additional affordable units. So the minimum density is 26 dwelling units per acre, as you can see in the table. And then if you want that, these are for rental projects. You have to have a 9% affordable, and then it's a sliding scale that goes up to 13% affordable on the far right. And that's what you need to have if you want to have 30 dwelling units to the acre as your density. Um, so that those are the requirements. Um, I think that for for sale projects, it's always just three percent. Is that correct? So for a for sale project, the requirement is is always three percent affordable. There's no sliding scale. But for rental projects, there's a sliding scale from nine to thirteen, which is the requirement. H happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you. Okay, we will have this item then come back on the 20th. Okay, uh, any other items for this evening? Nope, okay. Then. With that, we will adjourn to our regular meeting on February 20th at 6 p.m.